This is the original sacro-occipital technique logo. On the left, it shows um, a spine that has a little curvature in it, and underneath it says um, unbalance disease or imbalance disease. And on the right, on the plumb line, which is the straight line going down the middle of this body, it says balance health. Uh, this was developed during the time that Desjarnet was developing uh, distortion analysis back in the early 1930s, and he called his approach sacro sacro-occipital therapy. He was an osteopath and a chiropractor, so he wasn't uh, necessarily always using the term technique. And uh, he wrote an entire book on posture analysis at this time called Spinal Distortion, 1934. I've got a copy of it, and um, it gets very deeply into posture analysis and what all the different postures mean. So what we do in uh, SOT is we determine what our patient's major problem is chiropractically, and that's termed categorization. So we categorize our patient, and this is done on the first visit. And what the category of the patient tells you is the big picture. So in this photograph, you're not really getting the big picture. You see a, a truck that's a little messed up. It drove off the road, I guess. And uh, the people are pretty upset. But it could have been a lot worse because there's the truck. And if it had gone over this hill, which is the category... Wow, there's a big picture there, right? So that's what a category is. It's stepping away from the individual subluxation that you find on a patient and seeing the whole body as a category of dysfunction. All chiropractic analysis systems use um, different you know, some method of analysis of determining where are you going to adjust and how are you going to do it. So we use palpation, static, and motion. And we use um, observation. We look at the patient, high or low gluteal fold. We look at their posture on a plumb line. Um, we, some people use leg checks, some people use muscle testing. We look at x-ray and we might do some measurements on the film to get the listing, the degree of misalignment. There's energetic approaches to chiropractic analysis that are used in certain techniques. And there's more than just this list. But what we all have in common is we all look at the output of the patient. What is the patient showing us? The adjustment is all about input. And by output, I mean neurological output in the form of all those previous findings. So let's look at that for a second. We know that input affects output. Uh, if you eat bad food, you're going to get sick. If you have a car accident, your neck is going to hurt, <laughs> etc. So here we have afferent or input issues, and it could be that, let's say, you're a smoker. Well, that's going to irritate your lungs. The lungs are going to note that, and the brain is going to know that the lungs are irritated, and the brain is going to try to compensate for that in some way, shape, or form. Some things we do that there just isn't any compensation for. Uh, diet and medication. You know, if your diet is terrible, you're going to feel it. Uh, various medications have various side effects, and you're going to feel the side effects of those medications. Um, altered mechanics is much more our field of expertise in chiropractic. Um, let's say you're on a factory assembly line, and you repeat the same activity again and again and again and again. Or let's say that 
your shoes don't fit right, and you're walking in them every day. And eventually something's got to give. So we get this bad input, bad input. There's going to be an associated output, an efferent output, that's going to affect your body. That efferent output is a form of compensation. So you could even, you might say philosophically, that the output is innate intelligence, that the brain responds correctly to whatever the input is, and whatever the output is, is what we find when we analyze our patient. It might be a fixated segment, it might be distorted posture, it might be a short leg, it might be a weak muscle. Now, there are symptoms that go along with this, which is what the, the patient experiences subjectively. So let's follow this. Um, the functional neurologists tell us that a big source of afferent input into the brain is from general muscular proprioception and joint proprioception. And within a muscle, you've got a, a GTO, Gorgi tendon organ, which is stimulated by stretch, and that's when it fires. Um, and if the muscle contracts too hard, uh, it'll fire because that stretches the tendinous insertions. If the two parts of the joint are pulled apart too fast, the Golgi tendon organ will fire in order to get the muscle to contract so that the joint is not so uh, separated. Then within the muscle fibers themselves, we have muscle spindles, which are stimulated when the muscle is stretched or shortened. And then we have Pacinian corpuscles, and they're found in deep connective tissue around joints and also in the skin. And they're stimulated by pressure of the surrounding structures when the joints are moved. So these are all found w certainly within the spine, within all the spinal joints, but also in the extremity joints. And th that, when those um, proprioceptors fire, they go into the spinal cord and they go up the cord and they go through the brainstem and through the thalamus and ultimately they're detected by the cerebral cortex. It's interesting that on the way up from the proprioceptive nerve ending itself within the muscle, whether and or the deep uh, pressure receptors, there's only two synapses between the muscle or the joint and the cerebral cortex. One synapse is in the brainstem, and one synapse is in the thalamus. And the thalamus acts as a switchboard to determine what are the most important afferent inputs that the cortex needs to respond to first. And I equate that to being in the kitchen and you're cooking and you have a phone in the kitchen and at the exact same instant you accidentally touch a hot frying pan with your hand and the telephone rings. What are you going to do first? you're going to pull your hand away from the frying pan before you answer the phone. You might not even answer the phone. So you have made a, a con uh, uh, an unconscious decision. Pull your hand away first, it hurts. Then deal with whoever called you on the telephone. That's a, a very simplistic explanation of how the thalamus works. So the we have a first-order neuron that goes from the muscle into the up the cord into the brainstem. Then we have a second order neuron that takes that information up to the thalamus. Then we have a third order neuron that takes that information up to the cerebral cortex and the sensory uh, strips. Then the cerebral cortex does its magical thing through association fibers and stimulates the motor part of the cortex to make the right decision to send a, an impulse down the spinal cord back out to the peripheral parts of the body for an associated correct muscle response or joint response. Pull your hand away fast. So that's the output and the output can be a little woozy here um, depending on what the input was. 
And the output, interestingly enough, goes from the motor nerve cells in the precentral gyrus, which send messages which travel along their nerve fibers in the internal capsule through the midbrains and pons through the medulla, where most of the fibers cross over to the other side and continue downwards in what's called the lateral corticospinal tract. Some fibers remain uncrossed, and they go down in what's called the anterior corticospinal tract, and that term means from the cortex down the spine. The upper motor neurons synapse with cells in the anterior horn of the spinal cord uh, at various levels, depending on the muscles that they are supposed to supply. The axons of these lower motor neurons travel in their spinal nerves, to the skeletal muscles of the trunk and the limbs. Now, of course, in this way, uh, one side of the cortex controls activity on the opposite side of the body. So a lot of times, depending on the nature of a stroke that a patient might have, if they have a right-sided stroke, it'll probably affect um, the upper or lower extremity muscles on the opposite side of the body. Um, interesting to uh, note that... Um, there's only two neurons on the way down and only one synapse. Uh, so a single neuron goes from the motor cortex all the way down the spine to the level that it's going to leave the spinal cord through a nerve root, through a motor controller that will control various muscles at that level. There's only one synapse and only two neurons. So there's a first and a second order neuron only as far as the output goes. Now I maintain that Pretty much every method of chiropractic analysis of the spine involves this relatively simple neurology, whether it be posture or finding a fixation on motion palpation, finding a tender nodulation over a lamina pedicle junction, finding a spinous or a TP that seems edematous and won't move, finding a short leg when the muscles of the, of the uh, low back, uh, pelvis, and legs are unbalanced because of unbalanced motor output. Bear in mind, there's a motor strip on both sides. So one side can be affected more than the other. Even when you're using instrumentation, you're really measuring vasomotor control of subcutaneous blood vessels that are being controlled appropriately by motor output. Um, it's more autonomic. It's not voluntary, that's for sure. Um, that is changing blood flow and therefore heat measurement. So we have this categorization process in SOT. These are the objective things we look for that are telling us what category a patient is. What's the big picture? What is the nature of that cavern that's right near that subluxation that you found that we're going to deal with in SOT? So we're looking at the output. And we've got distortion, rib head motion, mind language, stress tests, arm fossa test, cervical compaction test, and heel tension test. And these are seven tests that you can run at the beginning of your care of a patient. And when you do, you'll get certain outcomes that will tell you what's the big, what's the nature of that big picture, the category of the patient. So distortion analysis, and I'll put all this up right now, is looking at the patient on a plumb line. So here we have a balanced patient. You're looking at the patient from behind. The vertical string is the plumb line. They look pretty balanced. Have them turn to the side and look at them on the string. If there is noticeable A to P sway, just back and forth and back and forth as they're standing there breathing, that's a category one indicator. And I'll explain the neurology behind that in a minute. If you look at the patient from behind and it looks like they're 
pelvis and their spine and their head are all over to one side of the string. And they sort of stay there. If you look at them long enough, they'll probably sway to the other side and then come back to this original side. That's category two distortion. That patient is taking weight over one or the other sacroiliac joints. That patient has a sacroiliac weight-bearing problem in that part of the SI joint that is designed to bear weight, which is the ligamentous part, the more superior and posterior part. If you look at the patient, and it looks like the string is cutting right through the middle of the pelvis, but the spine deviates over to the left or to the right, in the lower lumbars, that's antalgic posture. And that's a category three patient. That patient is um, getting into a position that is trying to remove an uh, irritated nerve root from a swollen disc or from a free fragment or from a herniation. And that is a pain avoidance posture. And we call that antalgia. Category 3 patients don't move because motion hurts. Okay, so let's look at what's going on on a Category 1 patient with A to P sway. They probably don't have enough inhibition of the postural muscles of the low back. Um, uh, certainly everything below about the T6 level. That's not low back, but that's where it starts. And so let's take uh, two muscles that are unusually involved in maintaining a standing position. Uh, pretty much when you're standing straight, you can rest on a lot of ligaments. You don't have to use a lot of muscle effort to stand up, to, to stay standing. We rest on our anterior longitudinal ligament, and we rest on our knee ligaments, and we rest on our iliofemoral ligaments. But an, uh, a pretty important joint involved in standing is the ankle joint, and there are no posterior ankle ligaments. We have all sorts of ligaments in our foot and ankle to stabilize, to prevent too much motion, medial or lateral, uh, but we don't have a totally posterior ligament. What we have is an adjustable tendon attached to an adjustable muscle group, the, the gastrox and the soleus, of course. So the gastrox and soleus act as an adjustable ligament. Um, we can't have too much ligamentous attachment posteriorly because we need to plant our and dorsiflex our feet while we walk. But we need to protect that joint. So one of the muscles uh, that doesn't receive enough inhibition might be the gastroxoleus muscle. And if that's the case, the... Um, the gastroc and soleus will be too contracted and they'll take our foot and put it into a plantar flexion position and we'll rock backwards. Then immediately our vestibular system will detect that and cause us to rock forward so we don't fall over. It's much more complex than that, but that's the general idea. So... Um, this A to P sway is associated neurologically with not enough inhibition. And one of the sources of inhibition down the cord is certainly from the upper cervical area. Um, occiput, atlas, brainstem, something called the pontomedullary reticular area, the pons and the medulla. And um, it's a, a big mishmash of of neurons that provide not only excitation, but also the proper balance of inhibition. And when you look at the patient, you get this A to P sway. That's a category one indicator in SOT and a pretty important one. So it's nice to have a plumb line in the office. 
Um, category two, lateral sway, that's due to the body's effort to avoid sacroiliac weight bearing on the bad side. And I equate this to what the uh, functional neurologist called hemisphericity because hemisphericity is usually more left or more right. And it's defined as a lack of metabolic capacity on one side in one, one some part of the brain. It could be cortical, it could be some part of the brainstem. You just don't have the ability on that side of your brain to maintain the function that that brain, that part of the brain is associated with. So it's called hemisphericity, and one of the main goals of functional neurology is to solve that problem, to create customized inputs that enable that part of the brain to uh, function better and, and not have metabolic insufficiency. Um, I think there's a relationship between functional neurological hemisphericity and what we call category two in SOT. And I think most functional neurologists will tell you that it's very common to find hemispherosity on a patient. And any SOT -er will tell you that 85% of your new patients are category two. Then we've got some, uh, a case of some structural degeneration in the lumbar spine usually. Uh, at the patient's trying to avoid pain. They're trying to pull the nerve root away from the bulging disc, and that explains the Category 3 posture. The lack of sway of any kind, these people do not sway left to right or A to P because it hurts, and everything that they're doing is, is an effort to avoid pain. So we look at the patient on a plumb line. Another thing we do is we look at the uh, reaction of muscles attached to the first rib that are responsible for flexion of the head, flexion of the neck down. And those are primarily uh, the scalenes. And we have posterior, middle, and anterior scalene muscles. And they're attached primarily to the first rib and somewhat to the second rib, and that varies from, from individual to individual. The scalenes laterally and forward flex the neck, and they're not supposed to raise the rib cage. If you stabilize the neck and you shrug your shoulders, you're raising the rib cage. That's probably more of a trap reaction than it is a scalene reaction. Um, and so what we do is we stand behind the patient and we palpate over the first ribs. I use four fingers. Dr. Dejarnet used his thumbs. Uh, that's up to you, whatever you can palpate better with. Um, we do know that there's more touch receptors in our fingertips than there are in our thumbs because the thumb developed as a gripper. The fingers are used for palpating. So I find that finger palpation is easier. And what you do is you stand behind the standing patient and you ask them to repeatedly flex their head forward and then look straight ahead. Look down, look straight ahead. Just keep doing that while you palpate. And um, you're feeling for unilateral or bilateral raising of the first rib. And it's really a muscular phenomenon that you're feeling. Um, and that first rib is compensatory to a Category 1 or a Category 2 uh, situation in the SI joint. You will feel bilateral, totally symmetrical rib head motion on Category 1 people, and you'll feel unilateral and or asymmetrical rib head motion on Category 2 people. So what if you find bilateral asymmetrical motion. That's an indicator of category one and two. Now you can't find symmetrical and asymmetrical, <laughs> but you can find, um, and you can't find symmetrical and unilateral, but you can find bilateral but asymmetrical, and that would be a combination. 
the rib head test is a form of motion palpation. So when we say rib head, we're not saying that the rib is subluxated. We're saying it's hypermobile. When you get a first rib adjustment, what's actually happening in your spine is a decompensation of the cervicals. Usually it's not the first rib head that actually moves. The first rib head should be very, very stable. That first rib is half the length and twice the thickness of the second rib, which is about half the length and twice the thickness of the third rib. Those upper ribs don't move very much. The part of the lung that expands at the apex of the lung at the very top is very small. So you don't need a lot of rib, normal rib head motion in the upper ribs. What you do need is a stable base of support for the scalenes and the neck above so that the scalenes can have their origin on the first and second ribs and they are then capable of moving the neck without lifting the shoulders. So if flexion of the neck lifts the first rib, you should assume that it's hypermobile. The first rib uh, T1 or second rib T2 area is hypermobile. The scalenes have been pulling on it long enough for an uh, edema to occur, swelling, and, uh, and you got a problem. So if you feel it only on one side, the problem in the SI joint is a category 2, and it's on that same side. The scalenes are one of a large group of muscles that compensate on the same side as the SI joint that's unstable. And that may very, very well may be the side that you feel fixated when you do motion palpation. The fixation is a muscular compensation on that side. That side may be unstable. And we're going to have better tests to tell this a little bit later in this presentation. I love the first rib uh, test. Um, practice it. See if you can find it on each other, on any willing victim. And you'll be surprised what it tells you about the low back and the category of the patient. There will also be uh, palpatory pain over that hypermobile first rib near the, near the spine. So notice that also. I don't have category 3 in this picture because there is no rib head motion on a category 3. There's no way for the scalenes to compensate for a category 3. So don't look for rib head motion on a category 3. If you don't feel it and you have a patient with a lot of low back pain, you probably have a category 3 patient. Stress testing is something I came up with on my own. Um, uh, what the patient does is they put one arm out and you test the arm in the clear before you do the test. I recommend stabilizing the same side shoulder, telling the patient, now patient, when I say hold, I'm going to push down on your arm. Don't let me move your arm, okay? I'm not going to push very hard, but don't let me move your arm. And you test it and the arm is stable. Then have them take a deep breath in and hold the breath in and retest the arm. Have them exhale and hold the breath out and have them and, and retest the arm. If deep inhalation or exhalation uh, results in the, them not being able to hold their arm out, that's a good category one indicator. Because category one ends up being an autonomic imbalance breathing problem. And breathing is the most primary thing we do. Breathing and pumping blood with our heart. You can't have one without the other. The heart needs oxygen to be able to pump. Um, the lungs need blood <laughs> to be able to uh, transmit CO2 and oxygen into the bloodstream. So they go together. So category one is really a breathing test, and it's a breathing problem, and very often it's also a heart problem. Um, it's associated uh, dorsally with 
a T1, 2, and 3, which is heart and lungs. It's associated spinally also with upper cervical, especially atlas and occiput. And in the low back, it's very much associated with sacrum. Uh, parasympathetic, sympathetic imbalance. Uh, category two is actually illustrated in this drawing. This is an original drawing. I really need to redo this because it's a little bit more sophisticated than this. What you do on a category two is you don't have them hop anymore. You have them just lift one leg. So here I'm standing behind the patient. They're lifting their right leg up. So I'd say, um, I'm going to hold you now. Lift your right leg and let them keep that right leg up for four or five seconds. Now put it back down, and then I test the arm. When they lift the right leg, they're putting all their stress through the left SI joint. And when they put their right leg back down and you push the arm and it gives way, that tells you you have a left SI weight-bearing problem. Most of the time, like 99% of the time. If they lifted their leg lag, their left leg, standing on only their right leg, and that caused the arm to blow out, that would be a, a, a right SI joint weight-bearing problem. I find the left is much more common than the right, but we do also see right weight-bearing dysfunctions. Uh, Valsalvas just asked the patient to bear down and recheck the arm right after they bear down, that's a Category 3 indicator for the same reason that Valsalvis can cause pain. So anything that can cause pain can certainly cause the arm to blow out. And there's other stress tests. I have the patient come up on the toes to stress out the um, midline ankle joint, uh, third metatarsal, talus, or tibia. Um, and there are several others. There, there's a lot of ways you can, you can dream up stress testing for pretty much any joint in the body. As a matter of fact, the, if you know what activator it looks like, the different isolation tests that are done in activator are actually stress tests. But we're not monitoring muscle reaction. We're monitoring leg length in activator. Um... I'm going to let you folks read the research that I put in this presentation on your own. You are responsible for it on written tests, so make sure that you do read through these blurbs. If you want to look up the original uh, articles, you can do that through the library website. And there's quite a bit of a research regarding muscle testing. Uh, that is similar to what we do with the stress tests. Mind language is a real interesting mind blower of a test. There are skin reflexes all over the body. You'll see them uh, uh, illustrated in on charts like Chapman's reflexes. If you look up on the web, Chapman's reflexes or Bennett's reflexes. Um, acupuncture points, um, there's tongue reflexes, there's little uh, reflexes on the different parts of the ear. Um, those are uh, connections between specific parts of the surface of the skin and deeper structures within the body. From a functional neurology point of view, they are considered to exist because of what are called homologous columns. And I really don't know much about homologous columns. I think it's somewhat controversial. You can read up on that if you want to. I, I would never ask any questions regarding that. But suffice it to say for this simple presentation that there is a reflex associated with Category 1. And when the patient touches it, and you, again, try to push the arm down, if they're Category 1, they will not be able to hold their arm. Um, that is the PSIS. So in this picture, I would say to my patient, patient, touch 
the PSIS on the left, and I would palpate on them to show them where it is. Put the tip of your pointer finger of your left hand right on that spot, please. And when they do, and the arm is, is out, and I try to push the arm down, I can't. Uh, excuse me, if they were category one, I, I can easily pull it, push it down, and they can't resist. And it sort of blows their mind. Why can I not resist your push when I'm touching right here? And the answer would be much more complex than what I'm saying, but basically you're irritating an already irritated reflex spot that's reflecting the Category 1 situation inside their body. And the same holds true for Category 2 and 3. The Category 2 would be the L5 transverse process, the skin overlying it, and Category 3 would be the right the, excuse me, the styloid fossa, which just so you know, because I see people put their finger in the wrong place, and it's always the tip of the index finger that you want to touch with. The styloid fossa is right underneath the ear in that groove produced right in front of the mastoid right behind the jaw. If they touch there and their arm blows out, they absolutely are a category three. If they have pretty bad low back pain, maybe with sciatica. If they don't have any low back pain and they touch on the styloid, that's not a category three indicator. They're probably um, localizing to an atlas problem. It uh, could even be a TMJ problem. Now, not shown in this picture, that's pretty important with mind language, is a simple fact that a lot of times mind language doesn't seem to work. All, all the tests will tell you you have a Category 2 patient, but mind language won't work. And that's because the body can very easily compensate in such a way that the test, being very subtle, doesn't show positive. So uh, an easy way to remove the compensation that I recommend doing before you do mind language is to have the patient put two fingers on the sternoclavicular area right in the middle and then have them put two fingers of the other hand right over their belly button, right over the navel, and vigorously rub those two spots out. Sounds like a funny thing to do and it looks funny when people do it. Then do the mind language test. I stole that decompensation procedure from applied kinesiology, and it works well. And if you do that, mind language will then work very easily on 95% of the patients that you do it on. But you have to have them do that. Now, it doesn't matter what side you test, which arm you test, and it doesn't matter what side the patient touches. Dr. DeJarnett always said, have them touch on the left and test the right arm, but sometimes that's not possible. And you should get equal findings regardless of which side they touch on and which arm you push on. The arm fossa test is considered by most SOT people to be the most important test in SOT. Um... It may be. I, I don't have the same attitude about it, but it's an important test. It's also used in Thompson, and the way we use it in Thompson is to find the specific segmental contact along the inguinal ligament to perform a supine PI ilium adjustment on a drop table. The way we use it in SOT is we use it to see if a patient is a Category 2. It's considered to be the only pythagnomonic uh, category test and one of the few pythagnomonic indicators in SOT. The patient lies supine. They put their arm straight up in the air. Uh, you test the arm in the clear before you touch the inguinal ligament. Then you place four fingers over the upper inguinal ligament, press in A to P, Hold the press and tell the patient to hold again. If they can't hold, you have what's called a positive arm fossa test or a weak arm fossa. And um, what you're really doing is you're pressing into the sartorius muscle, which is protecting 
the instability of the pelvis, and it's involved in misalignment of the SI joint. Um, that's when you touch the upper uh, inguinal ligament. Then we do it again and we touch the lower inguinal ligament and the arm blows out. You're really pressing across the rectus abdominis. And those muscles are protective. Those are anterior pelvic stabilizers. And if the pelvis is misaligned in a very specific way, you'll get a weak arm fossa. If the pelvis has that misalignment, you have a Category 2 patient on your hands. Remember, that's 85% of all the patients you'll ever get. Mark Pick is an SOT practitioner of great renown from Beverly Hills, California, and he's a functional neurologist. He believes that um, what you're doing is you are uh, overwhelming the cerebellum's ability to regulate a motor action in a short period of time. And what that means is you have to say hold, say hold, then touch, push into the upper or lower inguinal ligament. We use four fingers to do that. Then pull the arm. It should be in that order. You could say hold and touch pretty much simultaneously. Then you want to pull the arm. You don't want to pull the arm before you say hold and touch because number one, the patient won't know what you want them to do, and number two, you're not irritating the joint. So pull the arm all by itself before you say hold and touch. Just tell the patient to hold, but don't push in. Then just pull the arm. That's called testing in the clear. And then see if the pressing into the lig uh, inguinal ligament causes the arm to blow out. Press with enough force that you're convinced you're stretching the sartorius or rectus abdominis when you push in. Okay? Now. Mark Pick, again, uh, provided us with this very beautiful uh, neurological summary of the arm fossa test. He has since sent me a, a much more, much more involved description of how it works. We don't need that for this course, and you don't really need this chart for this course either. But realize from this chart that the patient has to hear you. They have to feel the pull and they have to feel the press. And all that information goes up the cord into various areas of the cord is detected by the brain. And if the motor response again um, is appropriate on a category two, the arm will blow out. So it's sort of neat to see it in that format. I also want you to know that when you contact the inguinal ligament, always show the patient where you're going to contact them. Show them on your own body, point with four fingers, and realize that the, the um, upper ligament area that you're going to contact is only about an inch to an inch and a half above the lower ligament. Also notice that the lower ligament is more horizontal. So... I have my hand pointing, but the palm of my hand when I'm doing the upper ligament is aiming down and out. And when I'm down and out laterally and um, inferiorly, and the palm of my hand when I'm palpating in the lower ligament is aiming pretty much straight down towards the patient's feet. But always tell them what you, what you want to do and get their permission to do it. That'll make you more comfortable and it'll make them more comfortable. Um, they can cover their genital area with a hand from the other side of their body if they feel more comfortable or if you do when you first start doing this, but I don't have them do that. Um, there's usually no issue. You're only dropping down an inch, and a, an inch to an inch and a half. And this is the contact on an actual patient. This is the lower, my four fingers on the lower part of the ligament, my four fingers on the upper part of the ligament. Okay. Oh, this is more research regarding the arm fossa test. Read it on your own.
you have any questions about any of this research, I'll be happy to talk to you. This test is called the uh, cervical compaction test. First, we have the patient lysopine and simply lift the legs very slowly. That's pretty important. About a foot off the table. Keep the legs straight and put the legs back down. Then the doctor presses very firmly S to I, S to I towards the feet and maintains that pressure while you ask them to lift the legs again. If it's harder with S to I force for them to lift the legs, that indicates a pelvic dysfunction, the most common of which is category 2, SI weight-bearing dysfunction. If it's easier, that tells you you have some sort of primary cervical dysfunction that you would need to deal with first, um, which you might end up doing anyway on a, a patient. But you want to correct the neck to the point where when you redo this test, it's not easier to raise the legs when you press S to I. That's called the cervical compaction test. This is a favorite test of mine, heel tension. I'm distracting the calcaneus distally on the prone patient and finding one side being tighter than the other. That is a uh, gastroc that has lost inhibition. It's the same phenomenon as A to P sway, but I'm palpating it. And I'm noticing that very often both sides are tight, but one side's a lot tighter than the other. This is similar to the Thompson technique palpating for a painful gastroc, uh, for a posterior rock ischium or an AS ilium. The prone way is really not the best way to do this move. Uh, in the, the um, videos, you're going to see a supine way to do it that I like better because the supine way distinguishes between tightness due to some sort of foot or ankle problem and tightness due to real heel tension, real decreased inhibition. The finding of heel tension is a category one finding and a sacral finding. Um, if you have a lot of heel tension on a patient and you've adjusted the SI joint, you need to adjust the sacrum. The sacrum needs to be your segmental contact point. There's probably some subluxation of sacrum that has dural implications, and you're not going to affect the dura mater much by adjusting the ilium. So, since heel tension is usually found on Category 1 patients, and Category 1 patients are theorized to have some sort of sacral dural dysfunction associated with loss of synovial joint motion, I do argue that heel tension is a very good sacral indicator.